From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. I think it's fair to say that no one's led a company through a global pandemic like COVID-19 before. But the people who've been in business for a while and succeeded at it, well, they've managed their fair share of crises. They know how to deal with disaster. One of the things that I've learned over my career is when you face a problem, there's what you know, and there's what you don't know, and there's what you can do, and there's what you have no control of. And so focusing on what you can control, I mean, it it helps create a little more certainty in an uncertain world. That's Ellen Coleman. Right now, she's the CEO of a 3D printing company called Carbon. And no surprise, it's been a wild year. But I first heard Ellen speak a decade ago when she was the CEO of one of the largest companies in the world, the chemical company, DuPont. Ellen's one of a very few women who have run a Fortune 500 company. She was CEO for seven years, and that's amazing when you consider that she got the job the week after Lehman Brothers collapsed, during the darkest days of the global banking crisis in 2008. Talk about being thrown into the fire. That's exactly why I was so eager to get Ellen on the show. We're in this very specific and destabilizing moment. And Ellen has helpful tactical perspectives here. Here's Ellen. Every eye on in that company, they were all on me. Uh, did I look depressed? Did I look scared? Um, was my head down when I walked down the hall? I mean, you know, and they would try to read into it. And even though I had really close relationships with my peers, when you get elevated into the top spot, those relationships change. And I had to reestablish a kind of a new relationship with them. The economy being where it was allowed us to have very, very hard conversations almost seamlessly because of the environment. It pushed it. You, you, yeah. you had to do it. There was no happy talk. Oh, my business is going great. It's sort of like, okay, how bad is your business doing, right? Because <laughs> right. I have businesses who only lost 10% of their volume. I have businesses who lost 50% of their volume in in a six week period of time. Right. And so it really allowed you to get to the hard questions. It allowed you to kind of talk about the elephant in the room and, and what we could do to make the business stronger coming out of it. And I've heard you say before, like this idea that, that everybody's watching you, the blink of an eye, the way that you turn your head could be a signal of your concern, your judgment, whatever it is. How do you, navigate it. It's all about self-awareness, right? I, I had a great coach and, and, you know, an executive coach. The one thing she always brought to me was self-awareness, self-awareness, self-awareness. When you finish a meeting and it could be just like one of the worst meetings in the world and you're going to that next meeting, the people in that next meeting have no idea what happened in the previous meeting. They have no idea what's going on. You just got to clear your head, breathe, enter the room and start fresh because what they care about is what they came to talk to you about. And so you really have to have a level of self-awareness in, in that job that when I found it was freeing, it was really helpful just to understand that and reset myself. Literally I'd pause before opening the door in a meeting, kind of breathe and say, you know, look at my schedule. Okay. I'm here to talk about this and, and walk in. And did you develop a personal practice around how to do that? Um, forgive me for staying on this a minute, Ellen, but to me, it's sort of, it is to what it is to be a CEO, what getting your pitch perfect if you're a professional baseball player is. It, it takes a certain precision to be able to do that. Did you create some sort of a structure in your personal life to support your ability to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's like setting up for a putt in golf. You know, you have the same setup, right? So I had the same setup when I would transition between meetings. Or I'd make sure in, you know, working with my assistant to have 55 minute meetings. And so I could take a quick break, breathe, get a cup of tea, clear my head, start over, right? Take notes, write notes. Okay, I got to do these three things coming out of this meeting. And so we changed up some of how we operated to allow just a tiny bit of space to allow me to, to kind of get clear and, and reset. You got to have that. Otherwise, it just all runs together. 
And you also spoke about the importance in particular in that first year of listening. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to make a practice of listening as a leader? One of the hardest things I had to learn coming up through the ranks when you first become a leader is if you speak first, nobody else is going to speak because they figure that's the decision. So you got to stop and you got to retrain yourself to say, okay, who's got ideas? What are we thinking about here? I'm really interested in what you guys have to say about this. And you have to create kind of an environment that invites them in. It allows them safely feeling, you know, not like, you know, they're going to be judged or fired if they say something wrong to safely, you know, come to the table and bring their ideas. And that's something that I had kind of learned all through my career, right, uh, as a leader. And it, it kind of becomes, it's exponential in terms of its importance once you become the CEO. My people would often say, this meeting would go a lot faster if you just tell us what to do. And my response to them was, if I told you what to do, I don't need you because I can tell your people what to do. Save a lot of money, right? But I need your creativity. I need your energy. I need your intelligence to really help us through this problem. Ellen didn't set out to become a CEO. But growing up, she loved business the way that pianists love music or chess players love the game. It just suited her. She studied engineering and was very analytical, but she was also a people person and quite competitive. You know, I think when I was in engineering school, I'm a very social creature. Um, so I went into sales and, and high tech, you know, high tech, high um, manufacturing, right, in, in industry. And I learned that I didn't know a lot about business. I learned I didn't know why the products were priced the way they were, why our competition would do something that I considered to be stupid. And what we found out is competition is not stupid. They have their own strategy. And I went back at night to get my business degree at Northwestern. And that's where I fell in love with business. When I've always been a very competitive person. I played sports, played college basketball, but I fell in love with business and the competition and, and product and differentiation and strategy. And that's where I found my home. After I finished business school, I, I, I spent five years at uh, GE and then then moved to DuPont. But I, I just, I love it. I mean, I just, it's, um, it's, I think it's fun. And uh, so that's where, that's where I cut my teeth on it. I wish our listeners could see you visually light up just now, because it's very clear that it, that you, that you love it. But then you did something that I, I think is probably less often done now. You, you can challenge me on this one, Ellen, but you stayed at one company for a lot of your career. Why did you do that? Well, three kids might have been part of the issue um, because once you start having them, it's hard to move. But I had a lot of different roles at DuPont. I went into very different products, very different industries within the same company. And it, I learned a lot and I really liked what I was doing. And I was given more and more responsibility over the time there. And DuPont, all the business were headquartered in Wilmington, except for like two. So you could move very different jobs, very different industries, and not have to move physically from your home. And so I felt like I was getting the kind of the training and the diversity of experiences that helped me develop as a leader. And I didn't have to. I mean, I had opportunities to leave DuPont and to go elsewhere, but I was being developed. I had a great mentor, you know, who helped me really learn about myself and my leadership qualities and what I needed to do. And so it just seemed the right thing to do. So tell me a little bit about that mentor. Jerome Smith, he was a tough customer, but he and I forged a great relationship. He would hold the mirror up to me about what I did well, and more importantly, what I was really not good at as a leader. I had very sharp elbows. I probably came from playing college basketball. I would run over people. And, you know, I was you know, classic type A personality. And I had to learn that sometimes being the strongest or the most forceful, it wasn't the best way to get things done. There were very many ways to get things done. And you had to learn to read the situation. And so I did. I, I learned a lot about myself and about what it takes to be a leader and listening and developing people and hiring people who are smarter than you. He was really just a, a tremendous person to work for. You know, Ellen, I think so many people in their careers, they they want mentorship. They want sponsorship, which is a little bit different than that. And they don't know where to look for it or how to ask for it. I'm curious, 
have you for the most part sought that out for yourself and asked for it? Have you formalized it or has it come to you? I think in this case, it, it, well, it came to me. I knew he was a mentor. I mean, because we had a lot of a lot of long conversations. I didn't really know he was a sponsor until later when I found out he did advocate for me in different situations. And I've learned how important it is and tried to emulate that with different people across my career. And I'm a big believer that men have natural advocates in the room when jobs are being discussed. Women often don't. And so a couple of us senior women at DuPont really tried to play that role for women who were coming up through the ranks. And because I think it was really important for me to get to where I was. And I really think it's a really important part of the development process. We are still at a place where we do not have enough female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. What has your experience been like as a woman coming into that role? I never thought of myself as being different, right? Um, That's not the way I was raised. And yet when I got into the business world, I realized how different I was and how different I was being treated. And whether it was from being paid differently or different opportunities, it's there. When you get into a position when you can do something about it, you need to do something about it. But it just can't be window dressing. It has to become part of the culture of of the firm, of the company to really accept this and to make it as part of theirs. And it starts with things as simple as knowing your numbers, right? How many people do you have? How many are women and underrepresented groups? How many are hiring? How many are you tritting? How many are you promoting? What do you look like at the end of the quarter? I brought in a new head of HR. He was a real partner with me around development and then development around a more diverse and inclusive workforce. I really felt as I got to be CEO, I needed to play a role there. It was up to me to make the change in the company. So you lined up the importance of knowing the numbers. And you talked about seeing your HR lead as a partner in the process of nurturing diversity and inclusion. So what does that process look like? Yeah. So um, when I first started in the role of CEO, or really EVP, I mean, I sat down, I listened, right, to a lot, to our affinity groups, to women, people of color, Hispanic, Black networks, and I didn't like what I heard. And, you know, they experienced the company in a very different way than I did. They were really purposeful, trying to help, trying to really help me create a a much better environment, more inclusive environment. But I realized that when you're running a company that's with how many people we had, you know, how geographically dispersed we were, you know, I needed a partner. I had to have somebody who could help me create the kind of programs and policies and expectations, right, of of the company. And I was searching for a new head of HR at the time. and, And the person I chose was really strong at development, development of people and had a passion for diversity. He brought very simple tools a way a business can think about who they hire, who it trips, who they promote, what do they look like? And you can have those conversations when you're sitting there talking about numbers, not anecdotes. And those conversations get real to have the leader reflect on, how is it I hire, right? Where do I go to hire? And why can't I get diverse candidates? And, you know, it took a while, a couple of quarters of these kind of discussions to kind of get it to be part of the routine and part of the standard business process. And it can't be an afterthought. It has to be an integral part of how you operate. And he really helped me establish those kind of practices and policies and, you know, really expectations in the company about how we were going to operate. I know how critical that first year is that you're in the CEO role to lay out what you hope to achieve, to establish what your imprint on culture is going to be. And here you were having that first year against the backdrop of the broader economic recession. How during that year did you think not just about the crisis that you were in, which is something a lot of us are thinking about now, but about the long arc of the time that you would be in that role and the legacy that you hope to leave? So in the beginning, you're just trying to right the ship. And in doing that, I learned a lot about each of the businesses. I learned their strengths. I learned their weaknesses. I learned a lot about the leadership. I learned who was proactive and driving to get the change 
and who was hunkering down and just trying to ride it out. And, you know, so you have decisions to make about who really is going to help create the company for the future. And so we restructured the company. Less six months into to my tenure there, we collapsed businesses. We took a layer of leadership out. We created a much more streamlined company. The other thing we did was look at innovation. We took a look at whether it was research and development or business models or whatever. We were looking at an innovation in each business and how they were going to be more competitive coming out of the crisis than when they went in. And if we were making a lot of cuts across the company, we cut very little out of research. It was very minor and it was only the things that we really thought were nice to do and not necessary for the competitiveness of the company. And Ellen, just to be just for our, our listeners, and that's because research is really the thing that by double down doubling down on it, you're setting the company up to be ready for the future. It is the lifeblood of a company like DuPont. We invented most of the categories we were in and we extended those categories by further invention and change. And so it was really critical for us. And you know, we had product pipelines, we're in a very disciplined process there. And we really felt that if we maintained that. If we were able to maintain that through this crisis, we would emerge stronger. And we did. And we had some of the highest growth rates in the company coming out of the global financial crisis. And it was an important part of establishing the future of DuPont. And we restructured the company around really three pillars, around safety and protection, around alternate energy, electronic materials, things like that, and around agriculture. That was a huge restructure that really set the company up for a different kind of trajectory. I remember writing about it at the time. How did you navigate the people part of that with compassion? Certainly layoffs and restructures are, are top of people's mind right now. Talk a little bit about leading that. Yeah, I'll tell you, if laying people off doesn't impact you tremendously, then you're in the wrong business because it's just, it's, it's a hard thing to do. And it's because you feel for every one of these people, they came to the company with the hopes for a career and creating a life for themselves and, and through no fault of their own, you know, economic necessity, these things happen. And it's just really hard. And the future is in, in my hands, right. As, as leader of the company. And if that means I have to get smaller to get stronger, it means I have to get smaller. Last November, Ellen Coleman became CEO of Carbon. She took over from the company's founder, Joe DeSimone. I was on the board for three years. And three years in, is being really established tremendously, this technology, finally getting 3D printing to be relevant in manufacturing, in quantities, high quantities, a cost that matters. And it became obvious to Joe and I that everything that he did to make it a really strong franchise, what he needed, we needed to do was scale. And that wasn't his wheelhouse, right? That was more my wheelhouse. And we decided to swap roles. He's the executive chair. You know, I was lead director. He's executive chair. And, and I became the CEO and moved out to California. Kind of a little excitement, a little fun. And it is, it is. It's a tremendous team, a lot to do. And believe me, very different being a private company. And I think manufacturing as part of the economy is really, really important. And 3D printing at a scale, at a cost that matters, can really change the landscape and can really localize manufacturing again. During the, the crisis here back in March in the COVID world we live in, that we could move our printers from printing Adidas midsoles to printing face shields and nasal swabs. And, and we could iterate on designs in days and be printing that same day. And the next day it's in a hospital being tested. There was that period of weeks, really days, when all business ground to a halt. It just stopped. And companies needed to look up and make a lot of decisions very quickly. Can you remember anything about the, the decision to jump into PPE? Literally, it was a Monday, and we're watching what the state's doing, what the counties are doing. We're realizing we just had to shut down, and we had to shut everything down. And we were in discussions about, can we keep the labs open? We're not, you know, if we're not working on medical, we took a look at the, at the regulations. If we worked on things that were medically oriented, COVID-oriented, we could work, but if not, we had to shut down. So we literally shut everything down. And people in the industry, 3D printing industry, started talking. And, and founder Joe called me and said, there's a lot of chatter out there about what we can do in medical. What can we do in medical? And so we started connecting with people, I mean, literally in the first 24 hours. 
And four days in, we hosted a webinar for 300 people in industry and our customers who own our printers or subscribe to our printers and talking about, you can print a face shield, here's a design, here's how to think about it. And we start talking about what they could do. And then we started up our labs for the design and then the printing of the face shields. That was first. And we literally were up and running within a week. Ellen, you've been through so many crises over the course of your career. Were you scared? Um, no. <laughs> I know. So the one thing you know is that all you can, you know, focus on what you can control, right? So what can we control? And what we can do is see where 3D printing can be relevant in a pandemic. And, you know, can we print ventilator parts? Can we print? I mean, there were a lot of things that were happening at the same time. It was so fast paced. There wasn't time to be scared. I mean, it was, you know, if, if we thought work was intense before, we were wrong by an order of magnitude. And it kept people focused on on moving forward, right, as opposed to paralyzed by what was going on. So here we are. How do we position ourselves for an economic recovery that is going to do maximum good for business and for people? I do think we need to be more disciplined around containing this virus. I think we've got to, if, if we aren't healthy, if, we're, if our employees are afraid for their health, they're not going to be productive. And so if that means we have to work at home, I mean, right now, the staff and I are talking about how do we keep our culture going in this environment? How do we keep our people engaged? How do we keep them excited about what they're doing? Because that energy that was created in the beginning of, okay, we got to work our way through this. You get into a malaise, right? You get, you get, you stop being proactive and you start being reactive and that's not good for the company. It's not good for business. Yeah. I am worried. I think the recovery will be slow. But what I worry about more is how do I keep the connectedness, um, the connectedness not only with our people, but with our customers, you know, with our vendors. But I do, I, I think we see improvement. Yep. I think innovation is still key. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how can we help our customers innovate? Because that makes us relevant, right? That makes us important to them. And I think these are all things that we're really actively discussing right now. And, and you know, nobody has the answer, but we're going to try a lot of different things to try to keep the engagement up, the energy up, the innovation up. Well, when it when it comes to just extremely pragmatic takeaways here, you answered the first question I asked and the last question I asked um, with the same idea. And that is that it's really important to focus on what you can control, particularly in moments of great uncertainty. That's maybe the most important time to focus on what you you can control. Yeah, I mean, so I, you know, I'm a worrier and I've been a worrier since I was a kid. And I I guess my mother used to say, why are you worried about that? There's nothing you can do about it. So then I started to think about whether there was something I could do about it. So I challenged that belief, like just initially, right? And, and I became very good at saying, you know, where, I, where was I going to put my energy? And needlessly worrying about things that I can't control, just not going to help, right? And so I, I think that's been part of me, you know, kind of growing up and especially growing up in business. And I, I tell you, it, it, it works for your kids, too. It's not only in business. That was Carbon CEO Ellen Coleman. And I've claimed her advice as a mantra, control what you can control. It works if you're the CEO of a company, but it also seems to work if you're like me, a podcast host with a two-year-old and a cranky dog trying to think how you're going to manage through the pandemic when the weather starts to get bad here in the Northeast. Look, we're worriers at Hello Monday, and our producer Sarah Storm and I suspect we're not alone. When we focus on the things that we're able to change or improve, it really helps us. So we're wondering, what do you focus on when you need to feel more in control? Come join me and Sarah for office hours this week. Bring your tips and tricks. How do you remind yourself to keep going when the going gets tough? We'll convene as usual Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. To join us, follow me on LinkedIn or email us at hellomonday at linkedin.com. That's hellomonday at linkedin.com. 
If you like the show, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps new listeners find us. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Riando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Victoria Taylor, Juliette Barreau, Michaela Greer, and Cassidy Jackson can take on any crisis. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You also heard music from Paddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening. I'm curious, do you still go to Fortune's Most Powerful Women's Summit? I haven't been in years. I haven't been in years either. So um, I was going to go this year, but <laughs> probably not. I don't yeah. think that's going to happen. But I, it's a great franchise. And, you know, a lot of times it's just, see, it's like old home week. You're seeing people. I remember totally. the last one I went to, it was like all young kids. And it was like, all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, then us, us middle-aged people started to show up. It's like, oh, thank God, some of my peers are here. <laughs> <laughs>